This is a production of Cornell University Library. Um, welcome to Man Library. This is a chat in the stacks. It's our third for this semester. My name is Erica Johns. I'm the Research Data and Environmental Sciences Librarian. So I work with the uh, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And I'm going to give you a brief introduction to David Winkler today. And apologies for reading this. I have not memorized it, so we'll work with that. Um, David Winkler is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology with particular interest in the biology of avian life, history, and variation. Having received a PhD in zoology from the University of California at Berkeley, Professor Winkley, Winkler, sorry, <laughs> that is kind of cute though, sorry. Uh, <laughs> prof <laughs> professor Winkler conducted postdoctoral research at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, Oxford University in England, and Cornell University. He joined the Cornell faculty in 1988, where his work has involved a research focus on tree swallows, particularly their breeding biology and the biology of their dispersal and migration, which have led to studies of spatial ecology and geographic variation in bird life histories. Dr. Winkler is also widely recognized for outstanding teaching. He has twice been chosen as the most influential faculty member through the Merrill Presidential Scholars Program, an annual award in which Cornell's most outstanding graduate seniors recognize the teachers who have played a significant role in ensuring their success. He received the Cal's Faculty Excellence and Mentoring Award in 2002, and in 2007 was selected as the Stephen H. Weiss Presidential Fellow, a prestigious fellowship that recognizes effective, inspiring, and distinguished teaching of undergraduate students. Dr. Winkler's newest book, The Bird Families of the World, has been described as a beautiful guide to the global diversity of birds, valuable to both professional ornithologists and amateur birders alike. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Winkler as he introduces us to this important work today. Thanks very much, and thanks to um, all the staff here in Mann Library that have put this event together. Um, I uh, really enjoyed working with them, and uh, Lynn and Eveline uh, did a really nice job. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about this book that just arrived in December, and um, it's been in our lives for a bit longer. There are a few people in the room um, who've uh, had something substantial to do with this book. Uh, and so in addition to my co-authors, Irby Lovett is uh, off in Galapagos with students, and uh, Sean Billerman is... Uh, in the University of Wyoming where he's finishing up his PhD work right now. Um, but I also wanted to shout out to Teresa Pagan, where is Teresa, um, who as a freshman started working with me curating photos and spent her entire undergraduate career working on this book. Um, and uh, Teresa uh, earned the job of photo editor for the whole book. And so, um, Teresa, thank you. I also want to ask, uh, uh, thank my wife, Amy McCune, who's right up in front. Amy is a much better systematist than I am, and she uh, really helped me avoid a lot of stupid mistakes in thinking about how these birds are all related to each other. And um, she and our friend Barbara Page had a lot to do with the way the pages in this book look. Um, we had some wonderful discussions about um, how things should be arranged. And before I leave Barbara, she had a really big effect on the, um, oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> she didn't put all those lines on the, on the cover of this book. Um, this is a, 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 a JPEG, which I didn't look at cl closely enough. It turns out that comes from the publishing software, and I forgot to get the right one. Anyway, you can see what the book looks like in the back of the room. And Barbara was the one who um, reconceived the geography of the Earth to look at it from a bird's eye view. Um, and I thank her very much for that. Okay, so um, I want to just talk about why I write this book and um, why is the, the perspective that we take in this book um, the appropriate one. First of all, there are a lot of birds on Earth and they are awesome. I've been in love with birds since uh, I was a kid, and there are people in this room who have the same affliction. And um, it's um, just remarkable how many variations there are on a common theme in birds. Most vertebrate biologists look at birds and think of them as a fairly low diversity, kind of uninteresting group. 
because they don't really do much with their bodies the way, say, mammals do or fish. But within that constraint, they get the job done. Um, they are really captivating. And one of the, my challenges as a teacher here since 1988 has been to try to get the students who come through Cornell who are fired up about birds to think about them not just as things they love, but as scientists. And it turns out that the best way to do that um, is to start talking about their biology. And so birds vary a huge amount in their morphology and their diet. They, they vary in their length of their wings and their tail, the shape and size of their bill, what they eat, and really very interesting what they feed to their young. All these things are varying all over the place within the broad panorama of birds. In reproductive biology, this Tree swift is sitting on a nest made partially of saliva. Um, there's a lot of interesting details in the biology of birds. How they build their nest and of what? How many eggs they lay? Who takes care of the young? And how do they take care of the young? And how they develop as chicks? And when do those chicks leave the nest? All of these are variables that are, um, have quite a different set of possibilities across the spectrum of birds. In habitats and annual movements, there is a lot of variation as well. Where the birds live in terms of what kind of habitat they prefer, how big their distribution is, whether they have a little tiny range or they spread over half the, the globe, um, whether they travel every year, and if they do travel, how far do they go? These are all things that vary a lot in birds. But the interesting thing is that for hundreds of years, we biologists have been putting birds into a taxonomic category called families. This all started with Linnaeus, another Swede. I'm not a Swede, but I, I still have a, a, a fond attachment to Gothenburg and everything Swedish. Um, and the, the nice thing about the families of birds and, and the way that biologists have put these families together is that at the level of family, almost all that variation that I just talked about, and much, much more, is summarized very well at the level of the family. By that I mean that there are essentially no combinations of those characteristics that occur in some species that don't characterize a family. So some families are very small, have very few species. Some are huge, have hundreds of species. But biologists, before we had better answers, were fumbling around and looking at the properties of these birds and placing them into a taxonomic group called family. And families had this kind of coherent biological characteristic about them that made each of the families a distinctive group. So if you think about if there are any alternatives other than to look at the avian diversity by the family level, you might start with the fact, well, there are about, uh, where did I put my pointer? There, there are about uh, a little over 10,000 species of birds. Those occur in 23, a little over 2,300 genera. I know a lot of genera, but I don't know close to 2,300. Um, but I do know 243 families, and that's a little more manageable, and certainly 35 orders is manageable. But the really interesting thing is that as we aggregate from the species level to the genus level to the families to the orders, we finally get to the point up around here where the generalizations about the properties of the birds in those groups no longer fit. There's a heck of a lot of exceptions within the orders. But within the families, there are relatively few generalizations, I mean, re relatively um, few exceptions to the generalizations you can make about the properties of members of that group. So the family level really is the right level of detail. And um, if we went down to genera, we would have too many genera that had very, very similar properties. If we went to the, f the level of order, we would just have all kinds of exceptions to any generalization we'd, we'd care to make. The other nice thing about families is that, uh, that I've found that I've been whipping undergraduates at Cornell for 30 years now, and I found that, well, we didn't have to used to learn 243 families. It used to be more like 220, and the number is creeping up. But um, you'll see, get a notion of why it creeps up later in the talk. 
But this 243 is a reasonable number, that even people who didn't come into the ornithology class as birders or as total bird maniacs, if they stay with us and if they put in the work and don't let the work of memorization get ahead of them, they can master this in a semester. And I have all of the pep talks necessary to get, <laughs> and uh, all of the um, steely gazes necessary. <laughs> so it works. The other thing that's happened, and this is the really important thing that really um, flipped the switch and got us working on this book, is that there has been a revolution in avian systematics, in the organization of avian diversity, that's been caused by the fact that we now have molecular data that can give us notions of relationships in birds where because of that, that sort of small area of morphospace that they occupy, I mentioned that they're rather constrained compared to other vertebrates, there aren't as many morphological characters to try to find relationships in these groups as there are in others. And so we have, we, ornithologists have found all of a sudden that in the last 15 to 20 years, as molecular data became more and more available and as uh, molecular analyses became more and more robust, we started realizing that we could look at all of the birds of the world, this is all 35 orders, and make a reasonable guess at what the relationships are among them. So this is a phylogenetic tree linking all of those orders. And the really interesting thing is that there have been three kind of outlandish um, projects in, since 2008 that have done this, very ambitious, all three come up with very similar answers. And so that level of congruence and, and large, large amount of consensus, um, not, not entirely uh, consensus, but very close, made us think that we could actually put a tree up in a book and use that tree to organize the presentation of the families in the book and have some kind of hope that it wouldn't be just like totally out of date by the time it got printed. <laughs> so the, all this new molecular data has produced some wonderful new um, insights and a lot of them are really neat surprises. These are two birds that we've known about for a long time. Um, this is the kagu an endemic to the island of New Caledonia. We'll see its range map in a moment. And this is the sun bitter, a bird of, of um, Central America. And what we realized in this latest group of these three big analyses of all orders that, has been, that have been done, we realized that these two taxa, this one, the Kagu in, in uh, New Caledonia, that's Australia for reference, and this, the sun bitter, here in its, its range in Central and Northern South America, that they're actually sister taxa. And when I say they're sister taxa, that means that those two birds, there's only one species per family in each of the families, those two birds are they, each other's closest relatives across the Pacific Ocean. And so that seemed kind of surprising. And most people, nobody had really guessed this until we started looking at the molecular data. But here's one of the wonderful thing about these molecular analyses is that when we have a new relationship proposed by the molecules, and whenever we go back and look at that, we almost always see things, similarities, that we hadn't noticed before. And in this case, we never really paid much attention to the fact that kagus have a really striking wing pattern with all this chestnut and dark bands. And maybe it's just because this thing has an outrageous wing pattern, which is, give it, is what gives it the name of sun bittern, this sort of um, sun pattern on its wings. But when you start looking at them, you start thinking, hmm, maybe those things aren't so distantly related after all. And this almost always happens when we get the molecular data that suggests new sister group relationship. Now, the other thing about understanding these relationships better is that it really helps us define groups better. And specifically, because of all these large-scale molecular analyses and many fine-scaled molecular analyses on individual families, we can now um, start understanding the relationships among birds in such a way that we can make better distinctions of what the family should be. 
So I put these birds up here. Anybody know what this bird is? It's a toucan. It's an arasari. It's a small toucan. And these birds here are all called barbets. They, they occur in different places all around the world. And people always thought that this was one family, the Capitonids, and that this was another family, the Ramphastids. And okay, fair enough. But then when you look at the molecular data, you all of a sudden run into a problem. Because it turns out that here are all the barbets. Here's one group of barbets and, and three of the others. And the toucans are, are in the tree right in among them. Okay? And maybe this wouldn't bother you if you weren't a, a systematist, but it bothers systematists very much indeed. <laughs> and here's why. Because um, we really want to have um, we want to have our groups be natural groups in some sense. And the best way ever since Darwin, sorry Stephen Gould for the, using that phrase, but Darwin was the man who got us thinking and realizing that we could use phylogenetic relationships as the key to systematic classifications. And so what that means in the, in the current state of understanding is that any natural group is a group that includes an ancestor and all of its descendants. It's a group we call monophyletic. It has one, it's one branch, it's one um, natural group. And if you had a group for barbets, say you wanted to keep the family of barbets, it would not be a monophyletic group. It would be what we call paraphyletic, don't worry about the jargon, because toucans would be included within it. So in order to keep all of our families monophyletic, we have to recognize the New World barbets separately and then each of these groups separately. Okay? We, could, we could lump these three together, see that? And that would be a monophyletic group. And we could have then three families, but we prefer to have five. And um, the, it really comes down to a preference. And I want to give you an, a feeling throughout the talk of what guides that preference, and I'll tell you right off, what guides the preference is, can I teach it? So if, if I'm trying to teach my students how to tell this family from that family, if the families are three different families that all look just the same, then I'm not going to be really wild about that possibility. I want to have some kind of distinctive features of them to, so the students can learn to tell them apart. Gene. Oh, that green is just to show it's the odd man out. So if we want, no, that, that's just a highlight. The, the color of these tree parts don't matter. The purple, huh? I can clearly see it. Okay, good. Yeah, all right. So my point here is that if we want to keep toucans as a family, we got to recognize these others, okay? And that we really, with throughout this book and almost all people worrying about the names of birds, how they're classified and their relationships, all insist on monophyletic groups. That's the natural way to define a group. Now sometimes in that quest to define families, it gets kind of frustrating. So you, maybe most of you have heard of terns and gulls and maybe even heard of skimmers. And if, you've if you're lucky, you've seen skimmers foraging late in the day on some little lagoon by the coast. One of the most graceful, poetic things you can see as a bird watcher. Well, they're such distinctive birds, and terns and gulls are easy to tell apart. Why don't we have these as separate families? Well, the trouble is there are these terns called noddies, and they're not naughty as an N-A-U-G-H-T-Y, but they're naughty as N-O-D-D-Y, and noddies really mess this up because it turns out noddies that we want to call terns are, um, they're, they're, they're um, basal, they're, they, are, they branch off earlier in the family tree of those three families than the others. And so we'd have to recognize a separate family, not only for noddies, but there's another group that does the same thing, the little gigas um, fairy terns, the little white terns that lay their egg on a branch. Those terns, we would have to recognize two more families. So, I mean, I used to work on gulls, and I see lots of distinctions in the larity, and it hurts me every time I come to it, but we left those as one family because of the noddies and the, and the gigas turns, okay? Other times, though, we just can't do it. So here's a, if anybody's ever been out on a boat 
and especially in the Southern Ocean, they'd be, they'd be really lucky if they saw some albatrosses and maybe some storm petrels. There are storm petrels in the Northern Hemisphere too. And we always thought that these birds were all in the same family. These storm petrels, they're very, very similar until you look at the molecules and you realize that the albatrosses are stuck right in the middle of them. And there's one branch, which are the southern, um, the southern storm petrels, and one branch, the northern storm, storm petrels. And albatrosses are not clearly sister to either one, but it's clear that these two aren't sister. Okay, one of them is sister to albatross. We still got some more work to do, but if we want to recognize albatrosses, I think most people would not be happy calling a wandering albatross a wandering enormous storm petrel, okay? <laughs> and so if we want this as a separate family and they have tons of recognizable biology, then we got to keep these two. And then it turns out, when you start looking at southern storm petrels, you realize, oh, they have sh shorter wings and they have longer feet and they tend to, to um, dance on the water. This is a Wilson storm petrel. It's a member of that family. Whereas the northern storm petrels have longer wings, don't dance on the water, don't have as long of feet or legs, okay? So we do split at times and we do lump at times and every time it's kind of a judgment call. There are other things we get from all these new understandings of relationships. This is one of my favorite ones. This is a bird called a Shrike babbler, genus Teruthius. It occurs in the wonderful, hot, humid forests of Southeast Asia. <clears throat> Until about five years ago, we were sure this is what is called a babbler. And now we know that babblers, instead of being one enormous family, should actually be split up into four, which is what we do in the book. This one doesn't belong to any of them. It turns out that this genus and another genus called, um, called Airpornis are actually Vireos. And that's kind of interesting because up until um, three years ago when I taught ornithology and I gave a range map for the Vireos, they were an endemic New World group. What do I mean by endemic? They were limited to the New World. Nobody, none of the Vireos occurred outside of it. And now we have these two genera that say, no, 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 you got it wrong. These, we're actually more closely related to the Vireos of the New World than we are to anything in the Old World, which really got us thinking. And now when we see a Shrike babbler when we're in Asia, all of a sudden we pay a lot of attention and think, huh, well, I can sort of imagine that they have Vireo in them, okay? Here's the one that really gets us going because in those same uh, humid, forests of Southeast Asia, a bunch of us have been very interested in a group of birds called Old World Subossines. They have a radiation in the Old World tropics. Um, it turns out this is a bird called Sapayoa, and Sapayoa is an Old World Subossine. This is Sapayoa's range. It lives only in the wettest forests in, in the New World, some of the wettest forests in the world, in the Choco of Northern South America and, and Central America. And we now know it's actually an old world subossine. So this leads us to pondering some amazing mysteries. How can this one species be most closely related to birds that are way over here off the map? How the heck did it get there? Did it actually migrate all that way? I don't think so. I think what, it, what happened is it probably was once distributed all around the place and extinction wiped out all of the intervening forms geographically intervening forms. So we, we have a lot to learn and as we learn more about relationships we start worrying, thinking about sort of deep time and deep history. So this is the book. Um, there's some still available, Michelle, you still have some? Okay, for sale in the back if you like, uh, for five dollars extra I'll sign it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll sign it re very gladly. Okay, so this is what Amy and Barbara helped me to figure out how these things should look. So if, the, if there's only one species in the family, it gets a page. If there are more species in the family, more genera in the family, it gets a lot, sometimes a lot of pages. Because we have a painting for each member of, for a member of each of the genera um, in each family. And because I really wanted to do that because if you want to learn your bird families, one of the quickest ways to do it is take a quick snapshot of what do all the genera in the family look like. 
And that, to me, is one of the most valuable parts of this book. It's a little frustrating when you get to the hummingbirds or you get to the fly catcher, New World fly catchers, and you're turning a lot of pages because there are a lot of genera in those groups. But for most of them, it's a tidy little group to look at. So we have a summary of the key characteristics. We talk about the natural history and the, the conservation. And we have a section here which is really important. It's about relationships. And we worked really hard to bring, the only real references we have in this book are to the systematic literature. And we wanted to have a resource that was authoritative in the sense that it was informed by all the latest systematic um, research um, so that it would be really valuable to ornithologists. At the same time, it would be really wonderful, I hope, for everybody else. The rest of the, of the, of the accounts are, are really interesting for anybody who loves birds. And we hope, I've, I've put a lot of time into these little gray box texts too to try to um, excite your interest in each of the groups. And if you already know these groups, they, they serve as little refreshers. If you're new to Birds of the World, then these are a wonderful way to start with the little gray box. We have a map and we tell you how big it is relative to the human body. And we try to have some really nice photos. That's where Teresa came in, okay? So we hope you'll use this book and you'll let uh, families of birds into your life. Um, and uh, because to me, families are really amazingly good ways to store information about birds. So the reason I've been such a hard nose about teaching my students bird families in all these years is because bird people know a lot about birds. And we're learning more all the time. And there are a lot of ornithologists out there. And as we go through life as an ornithologist or just a general biologist, if you know your bird families, you have a structure in which to store all the information that comes across your counter. Um, and whether or not it's, a, a, it's what you would expect for that family or whether it's a, a, an interesting exception. Okay? And so this is why I think it's worth all the trouble to learn your bird families because if you do that, you're going to have the right most natural um, framework for thinking about bird knowledge um, throughout your lives. There's one other thing I want to mention, and one thing I put a lot of effort into in the book. And remember I mentioned that the vireos had been endemic to the New World until we found out that those two genera in Asia were actually vireos. The notion of endemism is a re really important notion in um, biogeography. And this, these are pictures of all of the endemic families in the Neotropical Biogeographic region. It starts with the Rias, the big boys, um, all down in through some really tiny tanagers and uh, lots of other groups that you may not have heard of, but are endemic to the Neotropical region. We have maps like this for each of the biogeographic regions um, in the world. And I think one of the really wonderful exercises, if, if you have this book and you go to the Lab of Ornith Ornithology, excuse me, and look at the new wonderful wall of birds, it's a slightly different take because the only things that appear in these maps are endemics, birds that occur in that region and nowhere else. And if you, there are some bird families that are not endemic to any of the regions. They're much more widespread. And so those um, Jane Kim had to put on the mural as well. I don't have those in these maps, okay? And so, but the important thing about endemism is that it's the endemics that give a given fauna, a given fauna of some biogeographic region, it's the endemics that give that fauna their distinctive flavor. So I've often had the experience that a student who took the course went to Nairobi, got off the plane, and within five minutes was seeing birds that they knew what they were. I mean, they knew what family they were in, and they knew a lot about those birds as a result. So this is why I, I claim that if you learn your bird families, you're never lost. All you got to do is see a few birds, and no matter how you've been kidnapped, um, <laughs> you're going to know where you are in a very short period of time. Okay. But the really neat thing, I think, is that when we start thinking about endemism, we start realizing Look, there's this little tiny island of Hispaniola. Dominican Republic and Haiti together are Hispaniola. And there are a whole bunch of endemic families of birds on that one island. 
Okay, and remember these families are defined because we have to have monophyletic groups. And we know enough about the relationships now that we can make these fairly fine distinctions. But then you have to ask yourself, why are these birds endemic to this one island? And what does that mean? Are they refugees from some diversification that's almost all extinct? Or are they some kind of cauldron of some new diversity that's coming online and will be there in another million years or so, okay, with some huge amount of species? So by worrying, thinking about endemism and, and endemics, if you have the book, study those maps. They're going to get you ready for the next trip to some exotic place. You learn the endemics first and you'll feel much more comfortable when you land. I wanted to um, thank a, a, a bunch of the photographers that I've worked with over the last four years on the book. Um, Chris Wood, Ian Davies, Drew Fulton, Nick Athanas, and Doobie Shapiro. They're some of my champions. Uh, have, have bailed us out so many times with images, and they bailed me out for this talk because I wanted to use some images that weren't in the book but I, I just wrote emails to each of them and they're very helpful and cooperative and wonderful um, photographers. And I also wanted to thank you for your attention. Happy to answer questions. This has been a production of Cornell University Library.